Welcome to Hanover Park. Good morning. Thank you all for attending this year's September 11th ceremony. If you can please rise for the singing of our national anthem by Detective Miranda. What so proudly we've hailed At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we've watched Were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say thus that star-spangled manner yet Dear Lord of Mercy, Prince of Peace, this date, 9-11, carries a heavy burden of memory. We remember the heroism of the many that lost their lives in saving others. We remember all those who suffered and died. We grieve for them still, friends and strangers alike, along with their family and friends. This date, 9-11, does carry a heavy burden yet. It's a heavy burden of memory. And it is right that it should not pass from our memory. But today in this prayer, along with the remembrance of profound loss, it also seems right that we give voice to our deep longing for peace. And with this prayer, commit ourselves to those actions that will draw us closer to our most ancient our most holy desire, peace among all God's children. Lord, grant us peace. Amen. Well, please be seated. This, uh, this morning, uh, this 9-11 day, a day that, uh, not to quote anybody, that will live in infamy for a long, long time, at least as far as uh, I'm concerned, having been impacted uh, as I was many years ago. I'd like to uh, 
acknowledge uh, a few of our guests here this morning from my board, John Kunkel, Charmeen Shah Jahan, good morning. My other members are hard at work, as they should be. Uh, Ada Corral, Sepulveda, our village clerk. I'd like to acknowledge Brian McGuire. Thank you, Brian, for coming, representing uh, Hanover Township. Just across the street, we're not in Hanover Township, so you went a long way to catch up to us, Brian, so thank you. Bob O'Brien from our Park District. Thank you, Bob, for, for being here. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the support of our village manager, Juliana Maller. Thank you, Juliana, for your support and continued support being here this morning. Craig Haig and our fire department, thank you. This means a lot to us, to the firefighters that are here. We remember you. We will not forget. Mike Minot. Mike is here representing the police department. Today I listed on the news and it seems how soon we forget the value of our police and fire. When this occurred on 9-11, the sun was shining. I was in my office and I was in denial. I couldn't believe any such thing could happen, understanding how the air traffic control system works. We were in denial until the second aircraft hit. I want to thank T.J. Moore, because we know mop-up comes to the public safety and it comes to public works having to go in and clean up and follow up, as many did on that day, and, and weeks to follow and months to follow. I'd like to thank a few more people that help us get this off the ground. Ann Delort, thank you, Ann, for being here. We will not forget that. It came from your heart. Frank Dominowski. Frank's already said a prayer with me this morning. Frank is here. Thank you, Frank, for being here. Where are you hiding, Frank? <laughs> there you are, back there. Thank you, Frank, for being here. Frank has already found a replacement, and he's, he's feeling totally blessed that he's not uh, moving, you know, as he retires from uh, the fine work he's done for us. So you found a replacement, a young man that grew up in Hanover Park, has dedicated his life to the Lord and his family. And uh, so we feel very uh, blessed and secure in Hanover Park. It's an honor to be a leader in this community and to thank you all. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to do a little welcoming. We will not forget our police and fire for, the, uh, for the, what they had to do. And we will not accept what's going on in the world where they're trying to identify our police officers today as the enemy. They are not. We will support them with good discipline, with quality training. As I've always said, and I've said time and time again, our goal in the Village of Hanover Park is to assure that we have fine training, fine equipment, quality leadership, because our expectation is each of you go home to your families at night. When your shift is over, I want your families to know that we've done everything we can to assure that your families know that you're coming home to raise your children and support your families in an equitable and fair manner. As you can see, these two fine apparatuses, I was a part of buying each one. The one on the right behind me, closest to the building, that was $925,000. We actually had to sell a building to buy that. When the uh, fire district came over into the village of Hanover Park, that was a big deal. We didn't need three fire departments, buildings, we just needed two. So that was a good investment. The second one we just bought recently was a million two. We paid cash. Why? Because we invest in the security of our community, in the quality of life for our officers that have to work these apparatuses and when they go out. We received a reduction of $50,000 because we paid cash. And because we didn't have to bond, we probably saved twice the cost. Because when you buy 
on time to buy an apparatus, a quality apparatus, that in, in interest in it is going to cover more than the cost, initial cost, when you do it over a long period of time. So those are the things that your board and your village support those of you that come to work for the people of Hanover Park. We appreciate that. We love you for it. We want to make sure you go home to your families. So those of you that um, when we were building our police station, we all signed a beam on one of these days. And uh, that's a part of our police department. Nobody can see that beam, but it's there. And that's a building that will live for perpetuity because of the quality that went in. So I feel proud about how we support and defend our community and the people of Hanover Park and, and assure folks that this is a community, a family-loving community, where families come to raise their children. Our school districts are exceptional. We argue and fight over dollars and cents, but we assure that our children will be well educated. So we're involved there also. And I want to thank all of you for being here today to be a part of this ceremony. And I just wanted to say those few words of welcoming and a moment of remembrance. We will not forget those days. Those were terrible days. And I can tell you from my position with the Federal Aviation Administration, we never expected an attack from within the country. We were not prepared for an attack from within the country. All our radars and all our technology was focused outward. Our internal radars, long-range radars, were not functioning with radar. They were functioning with beacon, an electronic device that enables us to see where aircraft are at perfectly. But when you turn those devices off, you become invisible in our skies, and that's how we were taken advantage of. I was totally afraid when those beacons were off and we had an aircraft heading to Chicago. I had two children working downtown. I was devastated by the thought. That aircraft turned around and went back and was headed for the White House or our nation, at our, in our nation's capital. They went down in Pennsylvania because people aboard that aircraft figured out what was going on. We're not stupid out here. So we're going to work smarter, not harder, and we're going to support your lives and your families and the people of Hanover Park in an exceptional manner. We learn from our past, and today is a day of remembrance, and I'm honored that you all came today. Thank you very much. Good morning. We gather this morning to both remember and to celebrate. To remember the lives that were taken on the morning of September 11th, 2001, including those emergency workers who can continue to suffer the debilitating illnesses caused by working in and around Ground Zero. Unfortunately, the death toll from 9-11 is far from over, and we will continue to lose these brave first responders for years to come. But it is also a day to celebrate the lives of all emergency responders who protect this great nation. And why do we need protection and protectors? Well, for me personally, and I'm, and I'm speaking for me personally, the clarity of this question comes from my faith. My faith teaches me that we live in a fallen world, a world that departed from its original design back in the day of Adam and Eve and their inability to follow God's direction. This fall, or failure to follow command, ushered in a change to the new world that has affected us since that time. An example of this interest of, entrance of evil 
into a perfect creation is evidenced by the son of Adam and Eve, Cain, who killed his brother Abel in a fit of anger. This anger, driven by evil, has continued through all generations and necessitates protectors who stand a line preventing evil from running out of control. These protectors stand a line as our first responders, police and fire, as well as our military soldiers. They do this as a willingness to stand that line and they believe, or I believe, that it is not just a job, but that it is a calling. A calling placed in each of our spirits by God himself. Now I realize that there are some here today who do not share my belief, and that's, that's okay. But for me, I have wrestled with the events of 9-11, trying to reconcile why it occurred and why I lost a dear friend that day. A protector who ran into a burning high-rise building as the occupants were attempting to flee. And why now his son, who is in his late 20s, is continuing the work of his dad as a New York City firefighter. Because of my faith, I believe that he is also called to do the job. And it is now his time to stand the line between good and evil. Today, I also think about that we need to remember not only those who perished 9-11, but to remember those emergency responders who continue to give their lives in local communities throughout this nation. Each year, we lose a total of about 300 combined police and firefighters in the line of duty. This day, in my mind, we celebrate and remember them as well. And finally, I ask myself, how do we honor those who have made the ultimate sacrifice? We have ceremonies like this, but I think it goes beyond these type of meetings. Um, the lowering of the flags, the, the music, the songs, the speeches that no one really remembers. I think we truly honor these heroes and how we go about doing our job. A good example for this organization that I would get the opportunity to represent and how we are honoring those heroes is in the work that the members of this department, the members of the Hanover Park Fire Department have done over the last two years in reduction of firefighter illnesses. The Smarter Study, wearing these crazy t-shirts that you guys love so much. The intrusive physicals, the testing, the probing, the medical monitoring that most of you have endured in the name of research is honoring those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. It is helping the fire service figure out why the leading cause of line of duty death is from medical concerns and not from traumatic injuries. I want you to know that your work is important. Whether you represent the fire department or you represent the police department, the work that you do is important. You stand a line, you fight against evil, but you also step up and try to find solutions to the questions that you don't understand. I want you to know that your work is significant and I want you to know that the work that you do honors those who came before us, those who we stand on the shoulders of as we go about doing our business every day. I also will say to you that it is my absolute honor to serve this community as its fire chief and to serve in a leadership role for this community and for those that serve. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for coming out this morning and join us in remembering those who perished on September 11th, as well as those who have suffered and perished because of 9-11 in the years since. It seems hard to believe that 17 years 
have passed since the day the plane slammed into the North Tower and began the deadliest terror attack in our world's history. On that day, over 2,900 lives were lost and thousands more were permanently altered. While the death toll that day was tremendous, there were also countless lives that were saved. It has been estimated that there were approximately 19,000 people in the towers when the first plane struck. Many of these lives were saved because of fearless men and women willing to take action and risk their lives for complete strangers. I have stood up here the last two years and talked about the heroic actions of first responders that day, as Chief Haig just did, and deservedly so. 343 firefighters and 60 police officers lost their lives that day. But not all the heroes that day were wearing uniforms. There are many heroic stories about ordinary people who did extraordinary things on that day. I think all of you have probably heard about the passengers on United Flight 43 that crashed in Pennsylvania. Several passengers on that flight had called their family members or friends after the plane was hijacked and they had learned about the attacks on the towers. Knowing that their plane was headed for another target, which was later determined to be the White House of the U.S. Capitol, several passengers, including a Todd Beamer, Mark Bingham, Todd Burnett, and flight attendant Sandy Bradshaw, were not willing to give in. Knowing their fate was already determined, as evidenced by Todd Burnett telling his wife, I know we're going to die, but we're going to do something. These passengers decided to fight. Knowing the lives of innocent people were at stake, they showed great courage, and because of their courage, an unknown amount of, an unknown amount of lives were saved while losing their own. Another name some of you may know is Wells Crowther. Wells Crowther was 24 years old. He had his whole life in front of him. He worked for Sandler O'Neill, a small investment firm, firm located on the 100th floor of the South Tower. Wells was killed when the South Tower collapsed, and his body was recovered in the lobby six months later. Upon the recovery of his body, his parents began to search to find out what happened to their son during the final moments of his life. While reading a newspaper, his mother read a story about a survivor who was saved by a man wearing a red bandana over his nose and mouth. Wells' mother knew immediately that it was her son. You see, Wells was given a red bandana by his father when he was eight years old. He had carried or worn that bandana on his person during his childhood, high school, and college years, and up until the day he died. It was later learned through the stories of survivors that Wells was on the 78th floor of the South Tower when the second plane hit. That plane tore through floors 77 through 85. Approximately 200 people were waiting for the elevators in the lobby on the 78th floor. When the plane struck, it killed the majority of those waiting for the elevator. Those that survived were badly burned and injured. Numerous witnesses who survived talked about being able to, not being able to find a way off the floor due to complete darkness, while others talked about being paralyzed by fear and shock and not knowing what to do. It was at this time that Wells seemed to, quote, appear out of nowhere and told their survivors that he had found stairs and everyone should follow him and to only help those who could be helped and start moving him to the stairs. Wells then led the group, including a woman who was carrying on his back, down to the 61st floor, where the group was met by some firefighters. Wells instructed the group to go with the firefighters, and then he went back up to the 78th floor to help the remaining victims by the elevator. Through right witness accounts, it's known that the man wearing the red bandana rendered first aid to the remaining victims and escorted another group of survivors to the stairwell where he sent them down. This would be the last surviving eyewitness account of Wells' whereabouts that day until his body was recovered six months later. His body was found amongst the bodies of several firefighters at what rescuers believed was a command post, only seconds away from the doors and an escape. When Wells was 16 years old, he served for a short time as a junior firefighter in his hometown, and his dream was to someday become a firefighter. It is believed that Wells had chosen to stay in that lobby and help the firefighters with the evacuation. And finally, the story of Benjamin Clark, a 39-year-old former Marine who was an executive chef at the Fiduciary Trust on the 96th floor of the South Tower. He evacuated over 200 employees from his firm and made sure everyone was off the floor before he started heading down the stairs. On his way down, Benjamin encountered a lady in a wheelchair who he stopped to help. Benjamin never made it out of the South Tower and was killed in the collapse while all the other employees from Fiduciary Trust survived. Benjamin is credited with saving 100 lives that day. So as time and the events of 9-11 fade, we must make sure we continue to honor those who died by telling future generations 
about the heroic actions of not only first responders, but people like Todd Beamer, Mark Bingham, Todd Burnett, Wells Crowther, and Benjamin Clark. These were stories of ordinary people working ordinary jobs, doing extraordinary things that day. I am certain there are other, many other stories of courage and sacrifice that day that never had the opportunity to be told by those who died. When our children or future generations talk to us about heroes, we must tell them that a hero is not defined by how far or hard someone can throw a, a football or baseball, or by how many albums someone sells or how many movies someone makes. A true hero is one who is willing to show a great courage even when faced with tremendous sacrifice. And on 9-11, for many first responders and citizens, that sacrifice was their life. In closing, I again thank everyone for coming out and to the first responders in attendance, a special thank you to all of you for the sacrifices you make and the courage all of you show on a daily basis. Be proud of the uniforms you wear and the work that you do. Please take care of one another and stay safe. Thank you. The fire service of today is ever-changing, but is steeped in traditions two years old. One such tradition is the sound of a bell. In the past, as firefighters began their tour of duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of the day shift. Throughout the day and night, each alarm was sounded by the bell, which summoned these brave souls to fight fires and to place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow citizens. When the fire was out and the alarm had come to an end, it was the bell that signaled to all the completion of that call. When a firefighter has died, it was the mournful toll of the bell that solemnly announced a comrade's passing. We utilize these traditions as symbols which reflect honor and respect on those who have given so much and who have served so well. To symbolize the devotion that these brave souls had for their duty, a special signal of three rings, three times each represents the end of our comrades' duties and that they will be returning to quarters. And so, to those who have selflessly given their lives for the good of their fellow man, their task completed, their duties well done, to our comrades, their last alarm, they are going home. Father, we ask you to continue to heal the wounds of our nation and that you would continue to comfort 
and sustain the families who still suffer from the losses incurred 17 years ago. Forgive us, Father, when we give in to hatred. Make us instead ministers of reconciliation, instruments not of hate, but of your peace. Make us builders, not destroyers, healers, not avengers. We give thanks for the shining spirit of courage and self-giving love that emerged from the darkness of 9-11-2001. With such models of heroism before us, may we make a renewed commitment to work for mercy and the kindness of people all over the world. Increase and extend our compassion for all those everywhere who are victims of misfortune, violence, or injustice. Help us to identify for ourselves those sources of life and light that cannot be shaken by any terror or terrorist. May we find in you, Lord, an unshakable place to stand and the courage to build lives and live lives of courage and conviction. Father, keep our hearts tender and our minds alert to human needs around us. May we seek out and find the works of love that we can do. Through Christ, amen. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans wide with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I will uh, lead the way before the wreaths, and we can uh, assemble back here afterwards. Please take a moment. Thank you. <laughs> 